When you make the most of what the Earth gives you, something special happens. At the International Culinary Institute of Myrtle Beach, you'll learn to apply both passion and technique to transform local and seasonal into sensational. You'll discover social responsibility and how to turn your passion for food into a sustainable future with tuition you can afford. You found your passion. Now discover your future. Visit ICIMB.org and apply today. Don't let me forget that. Hello, Hello everybody. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> uh, this is the National Culinary Institute of Myrtle Beach. I am I'm Chef Jeff Blunt. I'm, I'm here with, with my lovely assistant, Stella. Stella. She's, She's one, one of our, our recent graduating, graduating students here at Baking Pastry Arts. Arts. She just graduated, graduated the other day. And, and today, today we're going to be talking about chocolate and truffles. Uh, a little bit, bit of background, background about me. Uh, I graduated, graduated from, from a technical college, college uh, Central Piedmont Community College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And... Um, Kind of, when, when I came, came out of school, school I was into bread. bread. You'll notice some bread, bread behind me here, but, but I kind of started, started focusing on chocolate and really kind of delved into the, the wonderful, wonderful world of, of cacao. Then I had an opportunity to go and visit uh, a cocoa plantation in Hawaii, uh, and, and then in Mexico, and then Papua New Guinea, and, and so on and so forth, and really kind of got into it. Um, but, but probably about 13 years ago, I became an ambassador for Calibo, um, and that's when I really, I really started, started to delve into, into the process of chocolate, of chocolate and, and making bonbons, bonbons and things of that nature. And, and today, today we're going to share with you um, a little bit about the tempering process, how to temper, temper chocolate, chocolate, and also to make a simple chocolate truffle. truffle. For, so, so for those of you that are out there that are doing education, um, show, show you some alternative tools and some methods and talk about some, some good choices. Um, and, and some poor choices. choices. We're going to let you know what some of those, those are as well because we've, we've, we've stumbled across those as well. Um, and when, when it comes time to educating our students in the classroom, we want to make sure that they can successfully do what it is, is that we're teaching them when they leave our operation, operation here at the school. Or in your, in your case, your, your classroom's, classroom's there. there. Um, so, so we're going to first start just with talking about chocolate. We have, we have a couple of different chocolates here. I've, I've got, got uh, some single origin, origin stuff, stuff, some fancy white, white chocolate. I've got, got cocoa, cocoa mass. mass. This, this is the one that really throws, throws everybody off. off. Cocoa, cocoa mass. mass. Um, looks, looks really nice and fancy. Nice, nice calico, calico package, package here. here. Cocoa, cocoa mass. mass. Well, it's 100. percent People say, "Oh, I love dark chocolate." The darker, darker the better. The higher percentage. This, this is unsweetened chocolate. It just says cocoa mass, though. But I think a lot of folks when you go to the store, this is unsweetened chocolate. This is great for making brownies. Uh, and, and maybe, maybe making, making an actual chocolate. We actually, actually make our own chocolate, chocolate here at school, and we, we use the cocoa, cocoa mass to do that. We'll add lecithin, less than sugar, cocoa butter, butter um, and, and, and some, some other like vanilla, vanilla ingredients, ingredients and things of that nature to help with that. that. But what, what we, we use typically is either, either calorie or, or cocoa berry. berry. Oh, it's the same company. This, this is, is extra bitter way to kill. This is a 64 percent. It's one of the ones that we'll be using today during our demo. Um, it's, it's got, got a nice, nice uh, fruity, fruity flavor, good, good mixture, it melts well. well. Um, and and one, one of the things, things that I want to point out is when you get bags of chocolate, chocolate whether it's Calvo or another manufacturer, they will typically tell you the fluidity. And, and this, this is super important because, because when you're trying, trying to teach your students how to make chocolates, if, if it's, it's got, got a one drop fluidity, fluidity if it's low fluidity, you won't be able to do truffles and chocolates. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to be like trying to melt chocolate chips. Uh, out of the bag at the grocery store, store. and this, this is this is a challenge. challenge. So, so you, you want to start them off with the right step and, and helping them, them be successful. So pick, pick the right chocolate, chocolate to work with. Typically, a 58 or a 54 percent is just fine. Um, if, if you're looking for help on maybe choosing some chocolates, you can feel free to shoot me an email here at the culinary school. I can, I can help, help you with, with some alternatives as far as like man layering some things, things that might be easier and more affordable um, in your area, area because, because I realize that not all schools have the same budget. So um, we, we can work, work with you on that, help you out, help you, out, help you find something that will work for you. So, so we're going to first start. start. I have dark, dark chocolate, chocolate at a, this is a 54% dark, dark chocolate. chocolate. We, we refer, refer to this as Calvo 811. And we have an melter. Now the melters themselves, um, work, work very, very well. well. 
you, you have, have some, some other alternatives. alternatives. You, you can, can obviously microwave, microwave your chocolate. chocolate. You, you can use a double boiler, boiler but be careful the amount of water and steam, steam that comes up. up. But in, in our, our case here at the school, a nice warmer. If you, if you don't, don't have a warmer setup, setup you can also use a heating pad. So the, so the heating pads you can buy at Walmart or places like that. You can actually set it up underneath the metal hole. And you can actually control that temperature as you're warming things up and keeping them at room temp. So we're, so we're going to start first. first. We've, We've got, got some dark chocolate, chocolate here. here. I've, I've got, got this melted to about 120 degrees. And I want to take, take this and I'm going to table it and bring it down, down in temperature to roughly about 86, 87 degrees. Right, right now in the room, the room here, it's pretty cold. Um, but I'm, I'm going to use my ladle, ladle and my trowel here. here. And I'm, I'm going to bring, bring some chocolate, chocolate and just put it straight, straight onto the marble, marble table. If you, you don't have a marble table, you don't need a marble table. You can always find your contractors in the area that, that may have um, some, some different resources for you as far as, far as um, countertops. And, and what, what I always find interesting, interesting is, is when they, they cut out the sinks, sinks countertops, countertops, you end, end up with pieces that are about the size of a half sheet pan. This is enough work for someone to do their work. Uh, to, be to be quite, quite honest, honest on your station. station. You really you don't, don't want them spreading out. As, As you'll, you'll notice, notice here when I'm doing, doing this, you don't, you don't want to spread out too much. So we're going to take, take this chocolate, we're, we're just going to work it back and forth here on the marble table, table. keeping it really nice and tight, and tight in, in front, front of me. This, this will help. And, and using, using a shoveling motion, motion, I will come, come in, pick it up, and then slide off using the offset spatula. This, this method, method of, of tempering, tempering is called tabling. We teach tabling at first with our students, and then we go into a uh, seating method. I know uh, when Stella was in class, we started with a tabling method. And of course, the very first time a student has to pour chocolate out on the table, it scares the heck out of them. The big thing is you just want to make sure that you just keep the right amount of chocolate out and in front of them. And I tell them to go ahead and melt about a third to a half at first. Um, and the idea is that you're getting this to a sludgy stage and then mixing it in with the rest of the fully melted chocolate. That fully melted chocolate then resets the crystallizations and you end up with good beta crystals that work really, really well in the box. And then you have some time to work with it. So we're gonna remove this. We're gonna spread this out one more time. There we go. You can see it's starting to get thicker. I tell students that they've ever been to any of the candy shops before, places like the Fudgery and Rocky Mountain Fudge Shop and places like that. Um, it's pretty interesting to watch those professionals move chocolate around a table and turn that and get it to work for them. You just want to take your time and work at a steady pace and stay clean. That's half the battle, actually. Stella will do it. That's half the battle. We have white chef coats and we want to keep them white. Now you can see it's starting to actually like kind of sludge up a little bit. And this is what we were looking for. You can see it sticks to the outside of the spatula there. And as far as tools, you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive NSF tools. Um, your local hardware store has a lot of things for you. We've got some of these plastic ones. These work pretty well. I will tell you they don't last as long, but um, this right here is a uh, um, cobalt. <laughs> it works. It's never been on drywall. However, it will do drywall. So you can see now it's really kind of sludged up quite a bit. I'm going to pick this up. and bring it right back to the box and just remove it straight into the box. Like I said, if you just work nice, steady pace, you can get all this in without making a huge mess. Just take your time. There we go. And then there's gonna be time to clean off your tools while using those tools here in just a minute. The stuff that's in there is actually going to cause the rest of the warm chocolate to set for us properly. 
We want it to be fluid, but we want to have the right beta crystalline structure. Now we'll go through and clean our tools up using the tools themselves. And then we can clean the table off. When you clean the table off, rather than using um, hot water, soapy water, whatever, you can actually just use a little bit of heat. Blowtorch works, heat gun works pretty well. Um, if you don't want to bring a blowtorch into your kitchen, that's for, I know a lot of people have those now. Uh, with the popularity of creme brulee in the classroom um, and showing somebody how to properly use a blowtorch, I think is probably extremely important. Um, all right, so there we go. We've got all of our chocolate removed from the tools. We can now come through and take our chocolate. And then what we'll do is we'll take that chocolate and we'll just stir it in really good. So as these chunkier pieces go in, you'll notice that there's, if you really think about the process, and if you're one of those that's ever tempered using the seeding process, um, this is where it all of a sudden becomes much like the seeding process itself. Think of what we just made as the seed or the pieces, and we're putting it into the warm melted chocolate. And then of course that resets and realigns everything. So mix this through thoroughly. And then next is gonna be mold choice. Now we use these clear polycarbonate molds here at the school. We find that the polycarbonate molds, um, there's a lot of choices out there. You can go on Amazon, you can go on Websterant, you can go on Chef's, Chef's Warehouse, mm -hmm. JB Prince. There's a lot of places. You want the ones that are a nice, hard polycarbonate. Yes, they're 13, 14 bucks. That 13 or 14 bucks, this one is seven years old. My students use them all the time. And they last. Um, the really thin plastic ones that you'll find at Michael's sometimes, they don't last as well. And they're not, they really don't have a nice, clean edge to them. You can't polish them properly. Um, in this case, I could take a microfiber and actually go in and polish each and every vessel. I was actually, before we started our video today, I was sitting here probably for like 20 minutes polishing this. Um, but you just basically go inside and polish each and every little hole and make sure that everything's nice and clean. I don't typically wash my molds in the dishwasher or anything like that. Um, a light detergent, soapy water can be used. However, if they're kept nice and clean, you can pop out your chocolates and then go right back through with a hairdryer and polish them back up and put them right back in the case ready to be used the next time. Um, chocolate is one of those things that water and chocolate do not mix. So every opportunity you can keep this away from water, it's good. Not to mention, this is also like seasoning a pot or a pan, uh, much like a cast iron skillet. It has those little little bubbles in there. There are some micro preparations in some of these usually, and that cocoa butter actually kind of coats and seasons the mold really, really well. So for doing sprays and things of that nature, that helps. So now that we've got our chocolate, we've got our mold prepped. We're going to um, get our chocolate ready. And I wanna make sure it's, it's good. So what I wanna do is I wanna test that chocolate. So the best way to test the chocolate is to put it straight onto a, a blade or a device that you can check to see if it sets up properly. So this is at room temperature. I'm gonna go in, get a little bit of chocolate on the surface. And we're gonna let that sit for about two minutes and see what what we've got while that's sitting, we're gonna talk about the importance of keeping this stirred. Now, stirring this chocolate and tempering process, folks, to learn how to temper first after you understand the process itself, you then just have to practice the process. Um, and a great thing about chocolate is when we are playing with chocolate and tempering it, even if it's poorly tempered, at least we have something that we can 
eat when we're done. I mean, even poorly tempered chocolate, you can still eat. You can still remelt poorly tempered chocolate and then properly temper it. So it's not something that you waste when you do it. If it doesn't look right, you melt it all back down. As long as it's just chocolate and not a ganache filling or anything like that, you can melt it all back down and start the whole process over again. Take it up to 120, bring it down, reset and go. But you have to make sure that you're keeping it within those lines. Okay. Now, our next set here, just stirring. I've got one nice big chunk in here and I want to make sure that we are, we're right there. We're right at about 33 degrees Celsius or 87. So I'm probably going to have a little residual heat on that, but it looks like we're almost there. Stella will tell you this was not easy. What was your experience like when you first started this, Stella? Uh, whenever I first started chocolate, it was it was pretty rough. Chef Z even told me about the pyramid of shame my first day <laughs> from tabling chocolate because I had so many shavings on the side from the mess that I made. Yes. Um, however, through chocolate class, I found love for chocolate. It's one of my favorite things to do. Now. Yeah, but it's practice. It is practice. During your competition, you probably did chocolate work during practice, probably about an hour and a half each day. Mm -hmm. And I would say that after you did that a couple of times, you were able to knock that out. Yes, I mean, sir. even during the competition, you were just like chocolate work easy, but you learned the principles in chocolate class. And then of course, through practicing, you were good to go. So exactly. like with anything, right? Like riding a bike, making a loaf of bread, shaping it, um, different kinds of things that we do, even in the savory side, you have to practice what we've taught you in the classroom to really get proficient at it. All right, so I'm gonna clean that off. We're gonna give it a redip because that one was a little warm. It looks like we've cooled down quite a bit here. There we go, 32. And we'll see if that gives us the snap that we want. Meanwhile, what I'm gonna do, we've got our mold. Let's grab that um, white chocolate. I wanna to talk to them briefly about um, a little trick that we call dirty tempering. Dirty tempering is something that um, we do when you're doing competitions. And for those of you that uh, are getting students ready for pro start competitions, I think a lot of instructors feel like they need to um, temper a lot of chocolate all at one time. And we're here to tell you that you don't need to do that. When you only need four portions of something, whether it's piping onto a plate or making a little curl or a leaf or something like that. Um, you can do something quick and easy um, with this process. So what we're going to do here, we've got a piping bag. We've got our mold set. I've got some white chocolate here, and this is pretty warm. This is, this is probably in the one, 115, 117 range. I'm going to put just a little bit of that out, not much. And I'm going to work this back and forth on the table in front of me. I've got a piping bag ready. I've got a bag of a pair of scissors, and I'm going to take this down and temp very quickly in one little piece. You can imagine you would not need a very big piece of marble. You can actually have just a little piece of slate or even a nice flat plate would work, but you could do this right at your station during a competition live, and I will say that I've seen this young lady do this not once, not twice, but probably about 100 times now, um, during her practices where she basically did what we call in the kitchen, uh, dirty temper. And the reason why we joke and say it's a dirty temper is it's really kind of crude and quick, but um, it works. You can see that has gotten a little thick sludgy. That looks good right about there. Wouldn't you say? Yes, sir. Yeah. You be with it. yeah. You gotta be careful with that. I mean, cause it's, it, it can get thick on you really quick. We got our bag here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift that up. Now, what we've done, the process of, of crystallizing chocolate, um, even though this is white chocolate, that's kind of our little joke, our white lie, is um, it's all about movement and temperature and realigning all of those crystals. So if I hit this just right, we've got our white chocolate ready to go. We want to give our truffles today a nice little decor. So by doing this, we can give a nice distinct line. 
to our work. We'll bring our mold here and we're just gonna do a nice clean line right across the top. Okay. And that just sets up right in there. And we can take our tool and we're gonna remove the excess from the mold. And then I'm gonna hand this over to Stella just to kind of hold on to for me for a second while I clean this up. We wanna always make sure that we've got our, our mess out of the way. If you work really clean, um, you don't end up with a bunch of chocolate all over you and all over the places that you didn't intend to have the chocolate at. So that's usually a key part of the whole process. All right, so we've got some leftover white there. Dark chocolate is almost there. I'm gonna go ahead and fill up a bag of our dark so that we can fill those molds as that white chocolate is setting. Yeah, we're probably a couple of degrees over. That's probably why, but I'm gonna show you a little trick here. You can actually take the chocolate bag. This is a, a cold marble surface. We've definitely got crystals agitated in here. They're ready to go. And by cooling this off quickly, this will enable us to uh, fill our molds. And then we'll talk about ganache and centers and fillings because uh, when people talk about, oh, we make our own chocolates, uh, this day and age with micro uh, roasting beans and things like that and making small batches of actually chocolate in house. There's making chocolate and then there's making chocolate confections. And uh, in most cases, especially our secondary schools, you're probably looking to more teach them a little bit more about making chocolate confections rather than actually chocolates. Now, if you're interested in making chocolates, uh, we can help you with that. That's actually one of the things we do in our food science class here. Now we have our own, um, grinder and miller. So we can actually do that in house. All right. So we're going to fill this mold. And you want to fill it all the way to the top. And typically we let it sit in there for about two to three. Mm -hmm take our excess chocolate. You don't want to set that bag of excess chocolate down. And you really don't have to use a bag every time because I realize this is a disposable bag. Um, however, I do find that the first time a student does this process, that this really does help keep it clean. It keeps chocolate off the front of your apron and off all over the table. And of course it keeps the molds for the most part very clean as well. So we're going to get that little tap. We're going to tap the other way. And then one of the things that we like to do is off the edge of the table. And this makes sure that all the air bubbles. Now, as this is sitting for our two minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about shapes. When you're looking out there on the internet and you're looking at all those different molds that you're thinking about, here's one of the things about the molds. You want a mold that is easy to get out. You want something that is, uh, I would say, rounded. Mm -hmm. We have seen some of the squared molds and they look really cool. They're fancy, but they're kind of a pain to get out of the mold. And more importantly, the sharp corners, right? Mm -hmm. So the sharp corners, you try to get chocolate in those sharp corners and they don't really work as well. So um, having something like this one, this particular mold, and I'll give you the number. This is actually uh, mold number 1673. It's by Frank Hasnut. And it's from Chocolate World. It's a very popular mold. You can use it to make flowers. You can use it to make um, little quenelle dessert kind of candies. Um, and of course, it makes a beautiful bonbon that comes out of the mold very easily. So I like um, Chef Frank Hasnut. He designed this. Uh, he was one of our Chocolate World masters. And he's, he did a really good job when he did this one. So we've got about another minute to go on letting that kind of set. I'm going to grab some acetate. 
when you're dumping the molds, there is an opportunity that I feel like you don't want to lose out on. Um, typically, a lot of chocolatiers will dump the mold, the excess chocolate, out back into their melter. In this case today, um, Stella and I were thinking, why not show you um, a little bit of the acetate work as well? Um, because if we take the opportunity to show you, especially in the classroom there, two birds of one stone, you're always trying to maximize your amount of education. So this little process that we're about to do for you here will hopefully help maximize that. So we're going to take the mold. We're going to flip it over upside down right onto this acetate sheet. We've got room for this over there. Keep that in there. If you want to stack up like a walnut shell game, you can. So, all right. And then we're just going to take our tool and go straight down the bottom once, twice, and try not to invert and look at it. It's the hardest thing when Stella did this. You don't want to flip this over and look at it as badly as you want to, because what happens is gravity right now is working for us. It's coming down and it's creating that shell nice and thin. If you flip it back over, the top of the shell actually collects the chocolate. So I'm going to hand this over to Stella. She's going to place that down onto our Silpat mat over there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this, like I said, this lost opportunity usually, and we're going to spread this chocolate out nice and thin on this piece of acetate. And it has a, a color, a little bit of cocoa butter silk screen design on it. And uh, it, it really does kind of help when you're trying to do a couple of other things. So while making chocolates for maybe after dinner, you can make a nice little garnish for maybe the dessert or maybe a cake that you're going to be doing the next day. As soon as it starts to set up, that looks good. We're going to remove our excess. We're going to grab one corner of the sheet the other corner and then we're just going to give it a little shake this gets all of those little strokes because i think i've watched people numerous times and i know i did it for a long time you'd sit there and try to smooth it all out and then of course one little shake and you're done and it kind of does the, the job for you we'll move that out of the way and we should be in good shape we can roll this up as it starts to get plasticized it has like a little texture to it like it feels like plastic a little bit but it's still cut up, like we can actually cut it. Um, so we'll cut some shapes, we'll roll it up, and we'll put that away for when we're undoing all of our chocolates. Our next thing we wanna talk about is how to fill this chocolate with a ganache. And it's two easy ingredients. You've got the recipe in a piece of paper there, but I will tell you that it's very simple. Eight ounces of chocolate to eight ounces of heavy cream. That's the simple one. You can add butter and glucose and corn syrup and do other stretches, but you can even infuse some flavors in there by putting that into the cream or the milk. But in this case, what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and boil a little bit of cream and show you the process. Very simple. So this is eight ounces of heavy cream. We're just going to put that in the pot. And while that's boiling... Look, we've got our plasticized. I think we're there. Oh, a little bendy spot right there. Yeah, a couple little bendy spots. Partly probably because this is so cold. We'll let that sit just a little bit longer. But I've got my chocolate here, and it's in a separate container. This container works just fine. Um, this is something that's very common, I think, in most kitchens. Once this cream comes to a boil, we'll pour it over it. We'll let it sit for a minute and a half, and then we'll just stir, and it'll come into a nice, wonderful emulsion. Um, water and fat, um, because there is water inside the cream. So you can actually get that to kind of emulsify for you. But the key is slow and not on the stove. I see a lot of people try to boil the cream, then pour the chocolate into the pot. And that really doesn't work as well. You end up with that residual heat, cooking the chocolate and making a really big mess out of it. So this is something that's very easy and Ganache is probably one of the most versatile items in the pastry kitchen. Truffles, brownie topping, cake. Um, you can actually whip it up and make a mousse. Um, you can do layers, dipping eclairs. So many things you can do with the ganache itself. So we've got options. All right. So this is almost to a boil. For those of you that are wondering about um, cooktops, 
we have stumbled upon some induction cooktops here at the culinary school that have been absolutely amazing. Um, the ducks tops, um, induction cookers have been wonderful to work with. They're quiet. Um, they've got dual and that's literally already boiling. So now when I pour that on, you can't do that with your normal home stove. I mean that the induction really is an amazing thing. And the surface is cold to the touch. So it's nice. So we're going to let that sit, give that a little shake. And you'll see that chocolate just kind of start to melt with that cream. So now we're going to come back to our, our piece here. There we go. We can go ahead and cut. Just using this little simple blade. And then we'll just roll this up just a, a little bit there. And we can unroll this later and you can see how that kind of works. The outer surface is probably already a little too set up. And then over to Stella. After about two minutes, you can really start to kind of stir this. Stirring, not a whisk. You do not want to use a whisk. Just stir it. And it's going to be pretty warm. And of course, already you're thinking to yourself, well, how am I going to get that warm chocolate ganache into the truffle? We're going to show you much the same way we did our tabling earlier. Um, Stella, have you already done the removal of the excess foot? Are we there yet? Like, like the shaving of it to keep the bottoms clean? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, cool. All right, so what, what I was referring to with Stella is, after you've already cast it and scraped it and you lay it down flat, after about, what would you say, four or five minutes, maybe? No, yeah, so yeah. Okay. So she's going she's gonna to turn it over now and check it, and then she'll shave it clean to make sure that uh, all the surfaces are good. So we can check and see. Good enough. Yeah. yeah that's nice. So what she's going to do is she's going to shave that off. That just gives you a really nice clean point of access. You can leave that sitting right where your melty spots were. Okay. I think Tuck's got a nice little camera shot straight down at those things. So yeah, he's got your little camera. Boom. <laughs> it's an overhead. All right. So now our ganache, that looks, I mean, watch this. Super nice, super clean, smooth ganache. Pour that all out onto the table. It's hot. So I can't put this hot ganache, obviously, into the truffle shells. It would melt it. Mm -hmm. So much like we did with our chocolate earlier, we're going to work this back and forth in the exact same pile of chocolate that we had. And we'll cool this off to a point where we can actually pipe it. Now, here's a really cool side effect. Now, I know when I taught you guys in, in class, the first time we made a ganache, we just cooled it off a little bit and then we piped it and then we waited till the next day. You can actually pipe this so that it actually sets up easily and with relatively, what would you say, in like probably like 15, 20 minutes, oh, you can definitely. set it up. Yeah, yeah. So in our case today, we're going to get this cooled off real quick. It's the great part about the little bit of marble we've got here, and you've got a bag already ready. She's got a, a couple of molds set and ready to go. All right, fill this back up. Once again, if you're just working nice and clean and organized, you don't have a big mess to clean off. And I know a lot of people think, I'll just go off the edge of the table. Inevitably, when you go off the edge of the table, it never hits the cup, it hits the floor. So take your time, make it clean, make it organized, have a plan of attack. You need to have a plan of attack when you're doing chocolates. Don't try to do too much in one day either. Oddly enough, um, I learned the hard way probably when I first started teaching that if I taught one chocolate in a day of class, at least in the beginning, the students had a much more successful rate of getting that one chocolate done very well, less frustration. And more importantly, let's not focus on how many chocolates you can make. Let's focus on whether or not you understand how to make chocolates. 
I think it goes back to that whole thing of take a man fishing. He catches a bunch of fish, but if you taught the man to fish, he can continue to fish for the rest of his life. So I think that you want to check that for me. Tim okay. feels good. Okay. Yes, All right. So Stella's going to put some ganache in her bag. She probably doesn't need to put too much because you know how that is. You end up with yeah, small hands, right? <laughs> if it's more than if it's more than the size of a racquetball in your hand, probably you've probably got too much anyway. So so she's gonna fill these molds up. Now these molds have had a chance to harden and fully crystallize. And what I want you to notice while she's doing this is the amount of ganache that she puts in. Um, you don't want to put ganache in all the way to the very, very top, because if you do that, you're going to end up with the issue of um, not being able to seal the mold properly. And a properly made sealed chocolate will last you almost three weeks on the shelf, no refrigeration. You don't need to freeze it. You don't need to use any artificial ingredients or anything weird that doesn't really uh, read well on the back of an ingredient label. We're just using chocolate and cream. Um, and it does work. It works very, very well. You'll see that she's going through. She's just piping those from one side to the other. And it just fills those up nicely. Looks good. It does. Is Bertha still on back in the back? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. When you're done with those, if you want to take that back there and uh, or the bag that you've got mm -hmm. and get yourself um, a little bit of chocolate out of Bertha for capping. You have a piping bag right there? Uh, no, sir, I got one right here. Okay, you got one? Okay, cool. So, yeah, those look, I'll grab that ganache. So, this ganache, you don't have to refrigerate this. You can leave this at room temperature covered um, for 24 hours. And at 24 hours, this is the part that I'm going to show you here in the, the uh, at 24 hours, that ganache that Stella just piped in, I'll show you here. You'll notice this ganache, and then this one has a little bit of, it's less shine. So you can actually touch that, and it looks like fudge. At this point, this truffle is ready to, to what we call cap. So what she's going to do now is she's going to come through and she's going to cap these clean. But before she does that, I want to heat the surface up just a little bit. I'm going to use our blowtorch. I'm going to come across, just warm those up just a little bit. That's probably enough right there. And then she can go ahead and cap it. Now, watch closely. When she goes to cap these, you're going to see she's not putting too much chocolate on. I've got a spot for you over here when you want to scrape off if you want to. A little bit whole. <laughs> Good. Okay. So she's filling those up. She's going to give it a little bit of a rattle. And then, of course, she's going to scrape off her excess. Stella's been making chocolates here at the school for quite some time, and I got you. Thank you. Um, some of her chocolates have been featured um, here in the restaurant at our Fowler restaurant for dinner service. At the end of the night, we serve chocolates as part of the end of the meal, and she does a phenomenal job coming up with wonderful flavors. All right, cool. I'll take that part. Okay. What part? This part. So you're all set? Yes, sir. Sweet. That looks good. So her excess chocolate that she's got tempered, I'm just going to spread this out here for a second. And then do you want to show them your chocolates that you made? Same ones. So Stella's got a, a set already set up for us. And it's kind of whenever you break the chocolates, it's like an ice box. You have to twist it. You need some room there. And place them on the plate. Oh, wow. They are gorgeous. Wow, those are super shiny. Nicely done. Mm -hmm. So these chocolates, um, when we're doing these, 
see if we can place one right here on the purple. Um, so you can see that nice white line that we placed on there. And here's one of the keys. When you go to cut it, it cuts through nice and clean. Shin, yes, yes, it still gives her chills when she hits those shells thin. Uh, and that's the key. The shell should be thin. Um, you can see that nice thin shell there. It looks good. Am I looking at you, Chuck? That nice thin shell. Hold it up. Heard. Um, this shell is super thin. Realize that your chocolate is your most expensive ingredient. So your ganache is your cheaper ingredient because you've got mixed with cream. So if you mix the cream and the chocolate together, and if 90% of the actual truffle is ganache or truffle mixture, you're saving yourself a lot of money. Plus, you're actually showcasing the skill set that a chocolatier should have, and that's thin, crispy, shiny, just beautiful shells that you can be proud of. That white really stands out on that mold. Let me bring that right there into the purple screen. That way he can get a, a shot of that, I think. Straight down, is that good? And those came out really, really nice. And then our last little thing, because that excess chocolate was over here, um, you can actually come in, any of your chocolate that comes up, um, you're doing cakes and things. All that, once you learn how to temper chocolate, the possibilities, folks, are endless. You just have to, you could spend an entire week with your students teaching them how to properly temper chocolate. And I'll be honest, um, you do this in the fall, and when it comes time to around Christmas season or whatever, which is usually the cooler time of the months, you can make some serious money um, and get some attention for yourselves here at the schools by selling different kinds of confections and things. It's a little bit of an investment on the front end, but I will tell you this, it will teach your students to be great entrepreneurs. It'll teach them to be resourceful. And who doesn't love a little bit of chocolate in their lives? So, um, but that's, that's chocolate and truffles in a nutshell. Um, practice the chocolate. Once you get tempering down, Pat, you're able to get tons and tons of activities off of just that one process, learning to temper chocolate. Truffles, bonbons, chocolate decor. This is one of our little Christmas trees that we make. It's kind of an alternative-looking little Christmas tree. It actually has some of Stella's truffles attached to it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Do what? Q&A. So we got some Q&A time. This will give everybody a chance to 